Hello and welcome to the God's Cast. My name is Steve Atwell. And I'm Chris Holcomb. And uh, today we're here to talk about issue six of The Wicked and the Divine, uh, the first issue of the second trade uh, titled Fandemonium, where uh, this already very meta fictional comic gets even more meta. Yeah, I guess that's a way to put it. So, um, you know, we sort of, you know, transition uh, once again from sort of face to face by way of T-shirt, um, which I think is kind of like a good way to sort of segue into this kind of whole, um, like, exploration of the, the fandom around the gods, where we really get a sense of, like, how is it that they've affected the culture? Right. So I'm assuming it's been some time at this point. Yeah, it's been a few months. Um, and in fact, uh, if you vent for a second, I will get my uh, device where I have this on and sure. check out so, exactly how long it's been. Uh, Lucifer Died for Our Sins is an odd... I was kind of affected by that in that... I don't know. I'm, I'm still a little confused on how the whole fandom thing works. I can't tell if there's godly powers going on or this is just uh, a pop culture phenomenon are they the new memes why are there no memes that burn out because you know everyone tries to go viral so like are, are gods ever not successful in getting this shit done it doesn't appear to be so ah well that's a very good question for um a few issues from now actually mm -hmm. um Something to keep in mind. Um, so let me just pull up Wicked the Divine. Um, fandom. Gotcha. So let me see if we have a date early on. Uh, come on. We've, oh, yeah, we've had a lot of technology issues just had today. Such a too. bad device so. today. Yeah. So, um, the, you know, sort of moment that we sort of, uh, come in, uh, with, um, Laura, where she's like, sort of is reacting to something that we don't initially see. And it's kind of interesting that like, she responds to, um, you know, and it, they like, they make you wait to turn the page to find out what it is. And it's a t-shirt with Lucifer died for our sins on it. Um, where we're sort of meeting two other kids in the fandom, and, like, Laura immediately kind of has a freak out. Yeah, and these these shirts just really threw me for a loop, and I don't know, I don't really have an answer, at least in this issue. Is there any godlike attribution? Are these just worshippers, or is this a cool shirt you can buy? Uh, a hot that's coffee? a good question. I, I kind of feel like it's somewhere in between, because... I mean, these are, these two kids are very similar fans to Laura, right? You know, mm -hmm. the, the one girl recognizes, like, where particularly she must have gotten that Inanna t-shirt. Um, they've both got tickets to um, to Ragnarok, which is, like, this big fan convention. Um, so you're sort of getting a sense of, like, you know, the sort of media phenomenon that they are. Um, you also get a sense from that one panel where, uh, you know, right before Laura vomits again into the dumpster that like, she's got kind of a little bit of PTSD going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's PTSD is the right word for it. And I was searching for it, but. Well, I got to figure, you know, if, if seeing someone's head blown, blown up in front of you, doesn't, uh, doesn't get you then. Right. This okay. Isn't the so... first time though. So you yeah. Think it... Um. Okay. So I just checked. It's been in this world about a month. Okay. So not that long. Yeah. Uh. And then we get this kind of like interesting catch up page where it's like they're sort of as Laura's clicking her fingers, which is this whole kind of running trope throughout this uh, issue and the next couple issues. Um. We also get a sense of like what's been going on in the media that. Um, you know, there's, Laura's been, uh, buried, um, 
the family seems to be suggesting that she's not a god. Um, Ball is continuing his difficult relationship with the media. Um, uh, the interesting thing, you know, for those of you who don't know much about uh, British politics, uh, Nick Clegg is the uh, deputy prime minister. This is back when uh, the Lib Dems and the Tories were in coalition and they're sort of being appropriately weaselly about, you know, well, it's all for the best that, you know, someone's head was blown up. Um, uh, Amaterasu is sort of um, kind of following the party line almost, the whole thing about, like, it's going to be 90 years for you, but it's less than two for me. Which suggests that there's continuity of memories. Yeah. But um, no one has brought up memories of the other human bodies they've inhabited yeah they're, they're, we haven't really discussed the past um and we do get to see that uh baphomet has uh decided to throw a uh valentine's day mascara in which the animated dead dance with the living and quote i love the banner at the bottom uh baphomet claims responsibility and that he is none more yeah. goth uh, his goth is just very tired to me. Yeah. Um, and then we get this interesting bit where Laura doesn't exactly, and, you know, it's, again, more with the finger clicking, where she doesn't talk with her mom, but you see what's kind of going on mm -hmm. inside Laura's head. Uh, I mean, so what did you think of it? It feels that, covering Buffy the Vampire Slayer, I see a lot of this, just not talking to your parents about what's going on. Um... Mm -hmm. doesn't particularly uh, make me feel any better about Laura. I still feel like her fangirl have a crush on these powerful MacGuffins is not very interesting, but it is, I do think it's articulate in how she's feeling and dealing with depression and uh, PTSD. And yeah, like I, I'm starting to wonder how much of this is real. Like the cigarette thing, did that actually happen or did she just, Mm. yeah that's a good question and you know she definitely seems to be doubting it herself like you know she clicked it in the cigarette lit but like mm -hmm. she's doubting her own sanity but it doesn't work anymore um and then the the line that i thought was kind of interesting is where she says um uh, i feel like my head is full of whatever stars are made of it feels my head's about to split in two and plasma i think my head is full of plasma but she interestingly says that she yeah, felt that way before it, she I'm met getting it. She's using she's using the language so, of the gods to describe teenage rebellion and depression. That's what I'm getting from it. Yeah. Um, so we then see her bedroom, um, which is kind of done in an interesting little sort of YA style. Um. And by YA, I mean Young Avengers, where uh, the same creative team uh, did a run-on, and they had sort of similar kind of uh, letter I had a question here. Uh, maps of rooms and things. Where is G? Oh, there's G. There was one that I was missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, G is um, on the sort of top right of that left I read it the first time. Wall. I think it's... Is it L that I couldn't find? The one where it's... Okay. Uh, L is hidden. Yeah, it's that. it's so, not there on the map because she's hidden. It. It's like Kindle Fire is not very big, so I'm kind of zooming in, like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. So you know, it's kind of I, I like it because it makes the whole. Again, like you know that this is being about the fandom, you get a sense of like what life is like, that there are, like, quizzes in magazines, that, like, she collects posters, that there's people who answer fan mail. Um, one yep. thing that's really important to note, um, F. So there, there's been a previous Ragnarok convention, uh, which she went to, which is going to be important for, for later on. And you definitely get the sense, like, when she talks about um, you know, last year's was tiny. This one is going to be bigger than Glastonbury, which is like this huge rock concert. I don't know how many people go to Glastonbury. 
I've never been to Glastonbury, but it's the question for me it brings up is like this she says last year's Ragnarok and do you have Oh yeah, like 175,000 people. Go to Glastonbury. Huh. All right, so here's a question. What di- what time of year is it supposed to be? Uh late okay, February. So Ragnarok existed 6 months ago, so they must have had a following before that. Um, so the the clock seems to be ticking down pretty quickly in that it feels like they're at least into a year into this cycle. It's a little late for new gods to be yeah, emerging. So, unless they each get two years from the time of emergence, but that doesn't really explain our first... Yeah. So let me see. The first... Do, 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 do. Okay. Going back all the way to, to volume one. Um... So there was a whole bit in 1923, and then it started up again. Um, hold on, hold on. So it started up again on uh, New Year's Day of 2014, and it had mm-hmm. been going on a little bit before that, right? Because this is Amaterasu's second gig, and she's been to like four or five other gods, mm-hmm. gods's gigs. So, um, it's definitely been, you know, if this is February, if this is a month later, I would get the sense that it's gone on for about four-ish years, uh, excuse me, four-ish months. And that I think the reason why the previous, um, uh, the previous convention was so small is that I think it was one of those things where like, you know, this is something that people know about because they've got some records from the 1920s and the 19th century. Um, But that, you know, the previous convention was all about, um, you know, well, you know, when is it going to happen and where is it going to be? Right. Because they know the, the schedule roughly. Um, And now it's like, Oh shit. You know, this thing that like previously, um, you know, was very niche all of a sudden is like blown up because there's actual, you yeah, know, gods among okay. us. So this Ragnarok happened didn't didn't need the gods to be um, existing to happen. So. Yeah, I I think it's sort of you know, it's like a, a fandom or like a. Okay, so um, we then move to uh, a scene where Inanna sends a note to Laura, and I kind of love this bit where you see her mother like twirling the phone cord around her finger. Yeah. And it like feeds into the way that they describe the what the voice sounds like. And I kind of love um Inanna's like conception of inconspicuousness. <laughs> uh yeah, Inanna's like, a, everything is purple. A showboat. Yeah. Um and then they meet at uh, Eleanor Rigby's grave. Um and all of a sudden there's Inanna dressed up like, I mean, you know, the, the visual symbol here is clearly Prince. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about Inanna for someone who only knows her from Snow Crash. Okay. So Inanna was one of the Sumerian gods of uh, love, beauty, sex, desire, fertility, war, combat, justice, and political power. Uh, also known as Ishtar. She was the queen of heaven. Um. And uh, it's kind of interesting that uh, just in terms of like what we learn about Inanna, um, this issue and like how gender and sexuality play into this, um, that her cult was uh, associated with uh, gay transvestite priests and sacred prostitution. So very much this sort of um, uh, sort of, attitude of like sexual liberation i guess i mean that's that sounds too 20th century but like sexual openness and this sort of like right little bit of gender fuckery um and oh the other thing that's kind of famous about her is that she descended into the underworld um and then uh had to sort of escape from the underworld um and so you know it may be that um because we were talking about in previous episodes, you know, who's an underground God and who's not, 
that like Anana okay. might have kind of a so Anana is a little bit uh, associated with sex as a ritual of some type. I, I use, you use the word expression, and I think yeah. that's true for this Anana, but somehow it doesn't ring true for like the ancient practices about what it was really about. Right. Well, it, it was like sacred prostitution, so sort of this kind of uh, commu- okay. worship through... We don't have any living religions that do that, basically. do we? Other than the... Uh, not... <laughs> I mean, outside of random cults that, that you know, get tied <laughs> into, you know, uh, federal prosecutions, not really. Um, but, like, it used to be a, a thing, it, you know, especially, um, you know, in the sort of pre-Trinitarian uh, era, where there's sort of gotcha. less of an emphasis on sort of uh, sin and those kinds of things. Um, and so what do you think of, of Inanna once we sort of get to see how he interacts with Laura? Uh, well, he's a little hard to read mm-hmm. in that, I mean, it's just, it's a lot of flash and it's hard to see like what's, I'm trying to pick out what's the brand and what's the person. You think the person would shine through a lot more mm-hmm. now that they're here at the grave of a comrade with no one watching. Yeah. Um... So one of the things I thought was super interesting, I mean, to me, the like the most kind of character establishing thing is where he says, like, you've been through hell. I want to hug you. Is that OK? Yeah. Like he's he's very much a sort of uh, a caring person and very sort of comfortable with like physically demonstrating uh, that. Whereas, you know, he's some of the other characters that we've encountered were a little bit more uh, inhibited or repressed or, you know, standoffish. He's sort of all, you know, very much like, you know, just kind of going for it right after they've met. Well, it's um, a, it is a personality thing... type of cult leaders. I don't know. Have you seen the leftovers? Uh, I have not. Okay. Uh, I did see who pulls, um, who pulls Wild Wild Country stuff. though. Yeah. So. Yeah. So the other thing that's like super important is that they knew each other or they'd at least been in the same room right. before. So this, uh, I kind of sat down here and said, okay, well, this person is interested in the Pantheon, and other than Lucy, we haven't really found out about who anyone was before. Is, is there a well, we knew him? that Lucy knew Amaterasu yeah. before. And the fact that Ball mentions that he knew he was a god before he became a god... It seems like belief and proximity to this kind of cycle and this energy has to be a prerequisite to become a god. But I'm not convinced of that. Mm. I don't know how a 12-year-old girl like Minerva would get into this, unless she's super weird on her internet search history. Yeah, that's the kind of the interesting thing. And, like, this is one of the things that sort of raised bells for me. Um, Because, you know... It, it seems unlikely that, or let me not unlikely, like, you know, remember one of the things that we were talking about before was uh, the whole thing about, like, is Ananke yeah. finding people or choosing people? And, like, how much of is there a link between the person and the god? And, like, it seems rather uh, coincidental, to say the least, that, like... Inanna used to go to god conventions right before they became yeah. a god. So I, I hadn't considered the Ananke um, here and whether she had any agency in how these things are chosen. Yeah. Um, so we then get this like disagreement argument between um, David Blake and um, and Laura about Kind of like, uh, I don't know, the academic equivalent of like, get off my lawn. Right. I assume as an academic, uh, you run into this a lot more than I do. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I try to be, um, I don't think I would ever say this generation is fundamentally lazy and entitled. <laughs> like, I think that's an attitude you get, like they, they implanted in you when you get tenure. Gotcha. Um, um, 
So, you know, but definitely like I've, I've been in classrooms in which like, you know, students and professors kind of go at it, hammer and tongs. Um, the thing I thought was interesting just in terms of like, again, how does this stuff play out in the wider world? Like, okay, so there are academic studies about this and there are conferences um, and they have theories about like, what does this all mean? Like, I don't get the sense that like anyone knows for sure. Uh, but he says, um, all the theories that I see, sorry, all the theories I see are that the gods speak to the culture. They come from as well as a gateway to what's next. Um, which is kind of an interest, like, you know, one of the things we were talking about is like, how much do the gods sort of, uh, how much of it is this idea of inspiration, right? Certainly Ananke has been making that argument, um, and some other gods as well. And how much of this is reflection? Um, the other thing I thought was interesting is, uh, like this, I don't know quite what this means, but the, the, the um, distinction between a vintage pantheon and a missing pantheon, like how much information do people have? I'd assume they don't have a whole lot. Uh, we ha they have visual records of the last one, but some of them not. Yeah, but it's like, you know, 1920s silent footage. It's. You know, just they, they, they can, um, and I, I should say like that, um, the, the main writer, uh, Karen Gillan, uh, has like these kind of writer's uh -huh. notes and a lot of it's about sort of the production and like why they chose to have certain paneling and stuff like that. But he does occasionally have some sort of useful, um, uh, sort of supplemental information. And one of the things he says is that the, um, that the miracles of the gods don't always record themselves. So he says like, they've got footage of like people in rooms reacting mm -hmm. to what's going on, but that the, the sort of miracle itself doesn't necessarily like, so here's, here's what's kind of bothering me about this. Okay. We, they only have records from the twenties and these are very incomplete. Well, those are those are the only sort of like immediate records. I'd imagine but there's a lot of I, written material from. I it feels you know. like that if this happens every ninety years, it's long enough that there could be. Uh, it's it's long enough to not really be in living memory. So, are there any false starts? Yeah. Are there people claiming to be gods who made them way into the records? How do they determine which records are genuine, which ones aren't? It feels like. I, I feel like uh, our modern yeah. academia would not put enough stock in this idea when the only hard evidence they have is from one cycle that was 90 years ago. Well, I mean, that's that's the only, like, visual documentation. I mean, speaking as a historian, we're mostly about the written word. So I got to imagine that people have been, you know, writing about the gods, you know, for potentially thousands of years. And I imagine that actually a lot of the the sort of conflicts in academia are like, how do you, you know, how do you chart ordinary myth and legend against these ninety year cycles? Uh, how do different cultures interpret? You know, because he mentions right that not all of these um, these pantheons appear in mm -hmm. Europe. That like there's China, there's the Middle East. Um, so, you know, I imagine that there's sort of, this would have to be a very comparative field. Uh, and he talks a lot I guess about it's a, um, cycles. For me, it's precedence. a matter of how... So it does seem... When did their universe diverge with ours? So these pantheons uh, exist, and if they're common enough that people uh, accept sure. them as an actual phenomenon and not some occasional hysterical uh, collective hysteria that can be written off as uh, anything else... What, and what does what changes in society did that make? You see what I'm getting at? That's what I'm really unclear on. It, it seems to me that it's yeah, it's I at do, least I a like, not it's not a fringe thing that this pantheon exists and comes back every once in a while. If there's enough attendance to have even a small conference on it, if it if there yeah. wasn't, it would be way too niche. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you definitely get the sense. I mean, we saw from the, like the first five issues, right, that there is a uh, taboo among the gods about like doing anything too blatant out mm -hmm. in public, but that they also have their kind of like 
gigs. So there must be like enough, you know, people have, you know, must have written down, you know, that they went to a, a concert or something like that. Um, but that like the extent of their powers, I think is something that they kind of hold back. Um, so um, we then like, you know, after uh, basically the two of them are arguing with one another from sort of generational perspectives and very much about sort of past and future, we then see um, Inanna himself back then. Right. And he's this kind of quiet mousy guy in the corner, as he said, uh, my go-to cosplay was wallpaper. Mm-hmm. And then we see him transform. And, you know, I'm always interested when we get a God's perspective on their own yeah. transformation. I, like, I, this I is imagine very it has to do with what's... from uh, what we see of Lucifer's transformation. You know, first right. of all, it's in his bedroom, which is... I don't know what to make of that. Well, I was going to say, it's in his bedroom, which is kind of weird. It's, I guess it depends like on the, the god that's we've seen being been outside. taken over. I'm, Lucy fell through hell, it looks like. Uh, but his attitude is very different. So they, the clothes are made, yeah, like, they can just make all, clothes happen? Uh, you know, leopard print and purple and, and sparkles. Um, but I do think Right. Yeah, I guess so. Like, it seems, I mean, aside from uh, Ball, who tends to wear Steve McQueen, um, you know, they they seem to be able to transform, you know, their clothes transform when they transform, and they very much have a personal style. The thing that I thought was kind of interesting is that, like, you know, in terms of the way that the, the god, becoming a god changes you as a person, Right, Eleanor uh, Rigby became Lucifer, and like part of the thing along the way was like being pissed off that she was about to die and kind of taking on this like attitude of rebellion. Whereas um, Inanna seems to have taken it as this moment of liberation, you know, where he says, you know, I used to be terrified about myself, and now I don't have any reason to be afraid, and I can be anything or anyone I want to be. Um, sort of a bit of a closet metaphor i guess get very a little on the nose yeah just a bit um so then we we find out why he's brought laura here um and it's all of a sudden going back to the mystery from the previous or a mystery from the previous volume which is who were the people who shot at lucifer and kicked off that whole shenanigans um and it's interesting that uh, he he says that he doesn't trust any of his own people. Uh, because remember, there was that whole fight between Inanna and Baal over what to be done about Lucifer, where he got put through a wall. Right. Yeah, I, having to question the motivations of the gods, I don't... Well, because remember, there's this whole thing of, like, we still have this open question... You know, if we think that Lucifer didn't kill the judge, then like someone in that group is a is a murderer. Yeah, my money's still kind of on Ananke, but I, I, I I've sort of been assuming that I've been assuming that Ananke has her own interests, which are running counter to those of the godlings. Now I have to stop to consider, okay, uh, which right. godlings' interests line up here, and they're all after their own thing, which I should have, yeah. So I'm I'm even more confused now. It's not helpful. Yeah. Thanks, Inanna. Okay, well we'll try to elucidate. So, um, yeah. So Inanna then uh, teleports into the morgue and performs a divination on the dead bodies, and finds out that this was a sort of a false flag operation. That these were not Christian fanatics looking to strike out against you know, Satanism or paganism or anything like that. But that they were fans, that they had been uh, part of the whole kind of pantheon, so, pantheon. The fans of who? Scene, it's it's just, it's kind of Inanna pulling the Ian Malcolm. I don't know if you've read Jurassic Park, but uh, yeah, it's a really annoying character trait that I, I wish writers <laughs> would stop leaning on. Lean on. Yeah, it's yeah. like, yeah, here's something important. Uh, it's obvious. Why don't you tell me about it? And they don't say it until later. So. Okay. 
So um, this news seems to sort of kick Laura out of her depression a little bit. Um, she's still doing the finger clicking thing. Right. But uh, she says that she wants to go to Ragnarok and speak at uh, speak at some panels. Okay, and uh, I guess we'll leave it there for the first issue. Uh, I do have some stuff I want to talk about the spoilers, so why don't you uh, plug your stuff and then I'll give you a 10 count? Sure thing. So as I mentioned before, I cover by the Vampire Slayer with my best friend and roommates. Uh, we are called Bitches and Money, and it's unscrupled. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Google us. We're really funny. My mom really says so. Thanks. Okay, so one, two, three, four... Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so the thing that I really wanted to talk about in the spoiler section here is the scene in that uh, last Ragnarok convention, uh, where this is where we see David Blake. And, you know, the thing that's really interesting is there's like a whole bunch of gods in that room, in addition to the two killers. You know, we have his son who becomes Mimir. We have Inanna in the room. Laura's in the room. Um, and I believe Lucifer is also in the room. Uh, although I don't think they, they notice each other. And, you know, it definitely puts a different spin on his, his sort of generational thing. In that, like, he knows that his son has... Well, he knows that the... The, um, the recurrence is happening because, like... He's been contacted by Ananga, and his son has been uh, sort of inspected by her. And he's sort of his whole kind of generational thing is like he now knows that he missed out, right? That you know he was born too old to to partake, but like he definitely wants to. So um, it it you know to me this sort of lends a whole nother. Um, aspect of the like Ananke finding people versus picking people because it seems almost like these cons were her hunting grounds where like she picks people who are going to be into the gods and might not ask any questions um and yeah how that all sort of flows from that we will we will go see so i'm going to stop recording now um uh in terms of my own stuff uh, you can find my work at race for the iron throne dot wordpress.com or i'm at stephen atwell on twitter bye hey thanks for watching the previous video from graphic policy television just by watching you help support our site thank you so much now if you're watching these videos you probably care about geeky things like movies television comic books toys games video games you name it you can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.